2007's Eastern Promises Review and Thoughts. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and we'll get into some serious topics. And, yes, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not spoiling anything. If I decide to spoil something, I will verbally warn you before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers, you can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. Once I'm done with the review itself and get into the thought sections, there will be lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. So, this movie is rated R, and so is this video. The MPAA rated it R for strong, brutal, and bloody violence, some graphic sexuality, language, and nudity. It is not the harshest of David Cronenberg's movies, but it's definitely... Yeah, there's a lot of, of very intense violence and gore. Now, I am not entirely sure how many times I've watched this. This is at least my second viewing, and I finished watching it right before I started recording this vlog. Um, let's see, the first time I watched it was in 2010. So, the plot. I'm going to be quoting from IMDb here. A teenager who dies during childbirth leaves clues in her journal that could tie her child to a rape involving a violent Russian mob family. And, let's see. Yeah, so, you know, it's set in, in England. It is not set in America. If it were, a teenager dying during childbirth would be on account of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But instead, it's the Russian mafia who are worse than American conservatives. It's a close race. And the, the one of the things the movie gets into is sex trafficking. Now, you youngins might not believe this, but that actually used to be considered just like universally morally indefensible. You know, before Andrew Tate tried to, yeah, popularize it. He's, he's done it, he's in, you know, told other people how to do it, he's bragged about doing it, and yet he still has supporters. Sometimes it's hard not to lose faith in humanity. Now, this was written by Stephen Knight, who I am not super familiar with, so let's see... Yes, he was one of the writers of The Girl in the Spider's Web, which is fine. It's perfectly serviceable. You know, it's nothing special, but it, it gets the job done. And, yeah, I actually, I'm not familiar with any anything else. Oh, he's supposedly at least writing Star Wars Episode Ten. Yeah, he, that's right. He created Peaky Blinders, which I hear excellent things about. Um, and he was one of the people behind the... Yeah, the 2019 miniseries Christmas Carol, which I've, I've not watched it. I've only seen analysis of it, but it really sounds like that was a very misjudged affair that really doesn't understand like I don't I don't think it's a problem I, I don't think that it should be seen as automatically a positive to say that an adaptation is faithful but I do think that it's good to, if you at least understand what the source material was trying to do and if you choose to, to you know, go in a different direction, it should be because you think that makes sense, not just changing things just to change things, especially if you don't understand. But yes, um, that is... But he's he's a fairly prolific writer. Um, he, yeah, he has 38 finished credits, 9 upcoming, 
the f oldest thing he has written is from 1990. So, yeah, that's not half bad. And the the script here is there's a there's a lot to to really to to love it. You know, like various other David Cronenberg films, there isn't any waste. There's no scene that exists just because, oh, wouldn't it be fun to do this? Every scene has some purpose. And I'm, you know, if, if you disagree with me on that, hit me up in the comments. I'm happy to, to discuss that. But I do feel confident that I can define a purpose to every single scene in this. You know, let me know if there's at least one scene where you feel like, okay, that was completely useless. You know, I'll, I'll share my interpretation of what the point of the scene was. Yeah, the, the, it employs setup and payoff pretty well. Everything that really needs to be in the film is in the film. There are things that we kind of have to, where we have to fill in the blanks. But that's not a negative, despite some user reviewers claim that it is. And let's see. So, yeah. Um, one, yeah, one, one user review said this of the... Yeah, of the of the film. Some of Canadian director David Cronenberg's early work is very interesting, but Eastern Promises is a very poor film. A story of Russian gangsters in London made in 2007. It just doesn't convince, falling back on cliches that feel outdated and with no connection to the nature of modern Russian crime. Indeed, even its portrait of Britain seems surprisingly uncontemporary. Although its portrayals might still be simplistic, the film might have made more sense had it been set 40 years earlier. And see. Uh, maybe it's unfair to blame Cronenberg too heavily. I think that this screenplay wouldn't have worked in anybody's hands. So, Cronenberg is someone who's not particularly interested in depicting the real world. And, and many have called his films cold and said that it's difficult to connect to, to the characters, especially the protagonists, sometimes especially the protagonists. And I don't disagree with this, but I also don't consider it to be a bad thing. He's definitely an acquired taste, and I get, you know, I, I'm i not going to claim, like, I fell into his, his stuff just looking for something dumb and violent and fun, and, you know... I was just too fascinated to to dislike it, though I'm not claiming that I love everything he's, you know, I'm not gonna, not everything he's done is a masterpiece, but the the yeah, I can absolutely imagine that, you know, it, yeah, if it had been set forty years earlier, and. Yeah, certainly it does, there, there are certain things that seem to, yeah, there, there are, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a huge amount, but there are several things in this movie that make, you know, it, it might not be set in 2007, but it's definitely not set, like, 67, you know, as, as this user reviewer suggested might have made more sense for it to, I, I don't think that I don't really disagree with these with with what this user reviewer says. I just don't think that it's a negative, and I'm not I'm not unwilling to criticize Cronenberg, but I think basically what he's trying to to convey here is that these these people are so stuck in their ways, stuck in the past that it hasn't really, and I can imagine that's not realistic, but I don't think, I, he's never struck me as someone who's particularly interested in realism in cinema. That's just not the, the choices, the choices he makes 
always run counter to that. And, you know, I find that more interesting. I would say there's a lot of great filmmakers making movies that are incredibly realistic. So, the, the yeah, I, th I think he is intentionally having it, yeah, having these elements that feel like 40 years prior. But, yeah, like, for sure, the, the yeah, cliches that feel outdated, no connection to the nature of modern Russian crime. I think it is fair to consider that a negative. I'm not sure that I personally agree, but I can absolutely see why that would turn off a lot of people. Now, the, yeah, so I have been a fan of Cronenberg since at least the early 2000s. I've watched everything of his that I've been able to get a copy of. So ranking them worst to best, and overall, I do love all of the ones I've watched. I'm not saying that, like, there's almost none that are, like, absolutely perfect, in my opinion, but, yeah. So, yeah, I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. The Brood, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Scanners, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, Videodrome, and yeah, that's right, in my opinion, Fly Defeat Spider, not the other way around. And I just realized I meant to... yes. You may have picked up, that list did not include this movie. At the end of the review itself, I will update the list with this movie's placement on it. And, yeah, like every Cronenberg film I've just mentioned having watched, this doesn't quite take place in the real world. And, yeah, this was one of those movies that came out, there, there was a, um, what's the word, like, um, in the early to mid 2000s, there was a an attempt made by Western cinema to try to bring more attention to human trafficking. This is one of those movies, the Mira Sorvino, Donald Sutherland, 2005 TV miniseries, Human Trafficking is another such. And that one is much more, much more gets into detail about it. Uh, here it's an element. And... Yeah, and, you know, Cronenberg does not want us to know if the characters are good or evil. He wants us to think about what we think, make up our own minds on it. And something that I can't help but bring up every single time I talk about Cronenberg, he has expressed in an interview that he believes there's comedy in all of his movies, and he's happy with how funny they are which never ceases to fascinate me. I, I am not... Yeah, that's, that's very interesting to me. And, yeah, so... Let's see... Yes, yeah, so some critic quotes. This could be the best actor-director collaboration since the hallowed days of Scorsese and De Niro. Agreed. This history of violence, dangerous method, and I can imagine Crimes of the Future 2022, I have not watched it, they're incredible together. And Cronenberg actually often only does one movie with the same talented star, even though, like, he's worked with some incredibly talented, you know, he's, he's made, he's, he's used as, for, for protagonists, some incredibly talented actors, you know, the the hold on I have it momentarily. You have people like Michael Ironside, James Woods. Hate his politics, but I can't deny he's he's very talented. You have uh, Jeff Goldblum. You have Peter Weller. Uh, hold on, I'll have it momentarily. Then we have. Ray Fiennes, Gabriel Byrne, Miranda Richardson, and then we have Jennifer Jason Lee and Jude Law. You know, just 
intensely talented actors. And yeah, um, Viggo Mortensen is one of the only cases. You know, Viggo Mortensen and the, uh, I can't believe, um, most recent Batman, uh, so I'll, uh, Robert Pattinson, are some of the only that he's cast in multiple of his movies. Some people argue that the movie is misogynistic, and that I th I definitely do think that considering that it at the very least means to have empathy for the the female victims and survivors of the the Russian mafia and, and you know organized crime in general. It's not like anti-Russia. It's just focusing on the the Russian mob. Yeah, it definitely could do more, and and this is something, you know, Cronenberg's somewhat cold, detached approach does sometimes, you know, there's it sometimes does lead to some misogyny in how cold and detached it is, you know, and yeah, that is I I I hope. He's able to improve on that. I, I am really glad he's still making movies, which is pretty wild when you think about the fact. You know, I'll, I'll real quick get the the list. He started directing in 1966. So let's see, what is that? 57, 56 years, and yeah, he has he does have something coming up. So yeah. And let's see. Yeah. Um, yes. This is this is very well put. Another credit quote: "The rigor of Mr. Cronenberg's direction sometimes seems at odds with the humanism of Mr. Knight's script, but more often the director's ruthless formal command rescues the story from its maudlin impulses. Mr. Knight aims earnestly for your heartstrings, but Mr. Cronenberg insists on getting under your skin. The result." is a movie whose images and implications are likely to stay in your head for a long time. And, uh, yeah, some people have described it as homoerotic. I forget if... it's It's been a while since I did the, the research... Mon months and months ago since I did the research for this. I forget if it was mentioned as a negative. I can sadly imagine it might have been. I agree that there's homoeroticism in the movie, I think it is very much on purpose. It, you know, it's depicting this very macho culture, and essentially, you know, it, it doesn't come across to me as homophobic, though I acknowledge that is something Cronenberg has been accused of in the past. In particular, I saw someone say that about the, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, hold on, um, Naked Lunch was accused of that. I am I, I don't feel qualified to to speak on you know whether or not he is homophobic. Overall, this movie in particular does not strike me as homophobic. But it definitely is making <clears throat> it is making the point that this very macho culture where there's little to no empathy for women yeah you know by nature you know if if you feel nothing positive for women and it's these men who are constantly talking about how constantly proving their masculinity yeah it can end up homoerotic i don't think it's an accident yeah, I've said everything I wanted to about that aspect. Let's see. One person said, I didn't really think there was much room left for ingenuity in the crime genre, but by setting the film in London, putting the focus on the Russian mafia, Cronenberg has found an area not often explored. And, yeah, so I'll, you know, briefly compare it to the the classics, the Godfather trilogy, various Scorsese, Scarface 1983. 
I have watched American Gangster, but like others note, that one didn't really add anything new. These are all excellent movies. I'm not saying this is better, just talking about differences. This is grittier other than Scarface never romanticizes the gang activity. Not saying that's true, that I agree that's true of Scorsese, but it is said of his and not of... I haven't... I, I would definitely say it's not credible to claim it of this movie. Let's see, and... Yeah, and, and to, to quote another critic, this is another thing where this is different from aforementioned uh, gangster classics. Like with Real London, the characters are somewhat alone, detached from the rest of the city walking around them. Let's see... Uh, yeah, the, the gang world and the normal world... Um, yeah, there's, there's a divide between them that is pointed out in the film repeatedly. And... Let's see... Yeah, another quote. As familiar as the, the plot might sound, well, it is not. The film starts with a murder, and the director, Dave Kronberg, does not spare us any of the gory details, but the world he portrays and the characters inhabiting this world would not spare us either. There are few more there are a few more bloody scenes in the movie, but the feeling of impending threat is stronger when you cannot see it. The characters are so real that they are scary. Nothing fancy, not much really complicated, yet so complete and reasonable in their actions. Viggo Mortensen's performance is absolutely outstanding. His transformation is amazing. His look, his behavior, his accent, I did not doubt for a second that he is Russian. Vincent Cancel is actually French, yet his character couldn't be more authentic. Throughout the whole movie, you can feel the connection between Nikolai and Anna, but they are so different in every possible way that you are not sure what that connection really is, fear or attraction. You have that constant feeling that any moment something is going to happen and you're not quite sure if it's good or bad. And let's see... Yeah, um, one person says the film's Russians are not conceived beyond vodka guzzling stereotypes, and Stephen Knight's screenplay, much in the spirit of the atrocious dirty pretty things, essentially transforms the nightmare of thwarted immigrant dreams into a tawdry sex expo. And I, I do think that there is a There is some truth to that. Uh, David Cronenberg is not used to dealing with real-life trauma, only sci-fi, so he may simply not have a uh, deft enough hand with this kind of trauma. You know, it, it is something where you need to be extremely careful, and that's something perhaps also... He is, he is maybe one of those directors that hasn't completely been able to keep up. I, I mentioned before, you know, he's been direct yeah he's been making films since 1966 that was a very different time you know back then yeah if you put something really harsh and violent you know on screen yeah there would be like pearl clutching conservatives who would say oh you can't do that but today you know we on the the far left you know yeah try to encourage filmmakers to go more in the direction of yeah having having a lot of humanity when dealing with these which yeah not Cronenberg's forte uh, some have argued that this demonizes Russians and uh, yeah I, I wish that I yeah, I, I can't really deny that, and it's made worse by the fact that the, the Russians in this that appear pleasant at first, you know, are, are later revealed to be evil, so it's, it's, it's one of those of when it, when it comes to, like, making a certain group look bad. And, let's see... Yeah, one, one person says it's inauthentic to Russians. Why didn't they hire any Russian actors? 
let's see, and yeah, and then they n name three Russian actors that they feel would have been great for it. I'm not familiar with them. I'm I uh, I'm honestly not very familiar with Russian cinema of, of today, and and yeah, Russian actors of of today. You know, I I do want to make clear. I think there's a tremendous well of talent. You know, in in Russia, the the Soviet Union. You know, some people don't like to admit this. I'm definitely not saying. You know, the Soviet Union on the whole had a lot of problems, but they did produce some incredible, unmatched cinema. You know, if you've never watched a movie by Andrei Tarkovsky, you are missing out. You know, the Solaris is is an absolute masterpiece. It's so much better than the American one. And I, I hate to say that because that is like the American Solaris like one thing is that it's so much shorter it would be very difficult for them to make it as complex. But it's directed by Steven Soderberg Soderberg, you know, who I hold in great esteem. And yeah, the the lead is George Clooney, and Natasha McElhorn plays a very important role. You know, the, you have the the right people to, but yeah, the American one is an hour and thirty nine, the Russian one is two hours and forty seven. It's simply, it's essentially impossible to to make the remake as. Um, deep when when it's it's almost cut in half and uh, but yeah you know about it being inauthentic and and them not hiring Russian actors I think sadly a lot of us here in the West struggle to tell the difference between Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans imitating Eastern Europeans it's ethnocentrism and yeah I, I I'm not going to defend that choice I do think the, the the cast do phenomenal here, but I I definitely yeah it's it's and that's again that's another thing where you know Cronenberg you know making movies all the as far back I I think the very earliest was shorts but he was writing and directing in 1966 back then yeah you didn't necessarily hi you just hired you know a white guy and had him do an accent or something. Some uh, argued why make something so similar to history of violence so soon after it. I think that there are enough major differences but I can appreciate certainly this and history of violence are much more similar to one another than if you look across a lot of his filmography. It, yeah, there is. People point out the story setup is very contrived. That is true. Um, so this this teenage, you know, sex trafficked young woman, you know, dies with her diary on her. The diary ends up in the hands of Naomi Watts' Anna, who is a you know she's a maternity nurse but you know this this young woman was yeah very very pregnant and yeah the 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 diary could implicate you know certain people and yeah the idea that she would be able to keep a diary and that she would be able to just walk around with it you know, it's it's in Russian, so there's a lot of Londoners who wouldn't be able to read it, but it's not like in code or anything. Like, it it doesn't really make sense. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna claim that it makes sense. I do think that the end result, the the movie that it ends up leading to, is so compelling that I don't personally find it difficult to forgive that. But I respect the people who say it's just too contrived for them. And yeah, uh, all Cronenberg films are about identity. I think I will talk about that in the spoiler section, but I don't want to give 
it away before. Yeah. Uh, one person said it was predictable, but nice flow. We spent time with both the good guys and the bad guys, getting to know them. And yeah, like History of Violence, it's in part about if violence is ever okay. The opening of the film does a great job setting up the rest of the movie, really like setting a tone and getting, yeah, giving you an idea of what it's like. And the rest of the movie does a good job paying off that. And I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. The I think the ending is is good. It's not the best of Cronenberg's, and let's see, yeah, that brings us to the characters. <clears throat> so yeah, basically the the lead is Naomi Watts, Anna Anya Ivanovna Kitrova. And, yeah, one critic says, Naomi Watts would have been the ideal woman for Alfred Hitchcock. She plays a British nurse looking for the family of a dead Russian girl amid the mob. There's something less than classic about her face, modern about her independence. She's like this perfectly woven garment of emotional temperatures, hot and cold all the time. The hot part has never come naturally to Nicole Kidman, who's got the mechanics of Grace Kelly, Janet Lee, and Tippi Hedren, chilly, cold, frozen. Watts evokes them in a more organically intelligent way. She seems to be feeling and thinking, especially in this movie, which requires her to be defensively tough and a little naive at the same time. Sorry I'm not making this entirely clear, but Cronenberg seems to get that Watts has an internal universe. She's the Hitchcock heroine remixed. And in an interview, Cronenberg expresses he's very picky about who he works with, and he felt like she was a rare talent. I, I would say that every major character in this movie, there's something going on under the surface that over the course of the movie you will realize. And this is, of course, very difficult to, to act. You know, a lot of the major characters are Russian Mafia, and then you have Anna, who is dealing with, you know, people that she's not sure she trusts. So everyone is, you know, hi yeah, hiding something. They're not quite letting their emotions to the, to the surface very often or for very long at, the, at, at any given time unless they lose control and I will definitely say there are some of the characters who who struggle with keeping these emotions down but yeah and and these are actors who are very very good at implying a lot let's see and right one one critic says paradoxically despite being the main character par excellence it's Naomi Watts who went out of her way in this film with a character who seems to be limited to following the flow of information who doesn't seem to have much else to do in the movie. And, yeah, I agree. Viggo Mortensen plays Nikolai Lucian. And, yeah, Mortensen says his performance was informed by Vladimir Putin. He watched Russian TV daily to immerse himself in the language. Putin was on the news constantly. Vigo noted his unfazed look no matter what was happening, or that cat that swallowed the canary expressions. His stance, how he held his hands, he also took into account Putin's military background, and yeah, and the, yeah, um, let's see, yeah, and, and the, let's see. Yes, another critic says, In Viggo Mortensen, David Cronenberg has found the perfect collaborator, not since James Stewart and Alfred Hitchcock has a director and star so perfectly aligned to make such thrilling entertainment. And, uh, yeah, one person... One person says, It tries to portray a Russian mafia drama by employing Viggo Mortensen as a macho mafioso whose mandolins borders on 300 homosexuality. The end result is a near-closeted tough guy. That's part of the point. And, yeah, Mortensen, I, I, 
I really admire that he's so soft spoken and humble in interviews. You know, huge star. You know, the, the like everyone knows his his Aragorn and and it hasn't gone to his head. Or or if it has, he's incredible at, at keeping that hidden in interviews. He's just yeah. And yeah, there's this like There, there is a, a every, every so often he'll say something that makes you think it's going one way, but other times it seems to be going in a, in a different direction with this character. That's as much as I can say with, without spoiling, but I'll get into it in the, in the spoiler sections. Armin Mueller Stahl plays Semyon, and Let's see, yeah, um, some people have noted he's playing against type. And, yeah, he tries to do something different from previous similar characters. And, yeah, like, they do... It's this great thing where he has this fatherly kind of thing. Like, he's very warm and welcoming until something comes up then he becomes very, very cold and very calculating. And, and yeah, like, I've never... I've, I've seen Mueller Stahl in, in various other things. I've never seen him quite like this. It's, it's very, very impressive. Vincent Cassell plays Kirill Semyonovich. He is essentially a loud-mouthed jackass, which, if you've seen Vincent Kitzel in much of anything, you know he's pretty good at that. I, yeah, um, I, I don't even know if they, like, wrote the character this way, or just Vincent Kitzel showed up drunk on set, and this is just what he did in front of the camera. I'm, I'm kidding. No, he's, he's great. It's exactly what is called for in the character. And I think that is, yeah, um, that's about who I'm going to, to talk about. Right, I, I do briefly want to mention um, Joseph Alton plays Ekrem, and, you know, there's... <sighs> Various characters express that there's, you know, he's, he seems, he can be very quiet, he can be very excitable, and yeah, he really, he strikes me as basically, he seems to be on, on the spectrum, and yeah, like the, both the writing and the, the acting there really really sell that like he every step of the way it doesn't feel like parody which you know it's it's always very frustrating when that sort of thing is just ridiculously overdone every so often over the course of the movie we'll hear some of the translation into English of the diary of of Tatiana the the sex worker and the voiceover is handled by Tatiana Maslani. Um, she was like 20, 21, 22 at the time. I know her primarily from She Hulk Attorney at Law, which I still defend. I don't think it's the very best Disney Plus MCU show, but it's gotten a ton of completely undeserved hate. It's not. It's not a misandrist movie. It's an anti uh, miniseries. It's an anti misogyny miniseries, and she's really great in it. Uh, like as Jennifer Walters and the titular She Hulk. You know, I I tried very very hard, and I could not. It doesn't at all sound. Yeah. She she doesn't at all sound like 
the same person in in these two which I mean I I realize you know they they came out what is it 15 15 years apart you know but she was al already an adult like I realize you know the the voice you have as a child and is different from your voice as a teenager from as an adult but she was in her 20s and yeah anyway she's she's really really good she, there's um very there's a soulful quality to the at times very poetic language in the yeah in in her her journal so the let's see yeah as far as dialogue goes there are 34 entries in the IMDb quote section all of them are good when they were dealing with the language element of the movie they decided that rather than cast a bunch of Americans and have them speaking Russian accents they cast a bunch of Western Europeans have them speak in Russian accents and sometimes Russian and they do this it's it's it feels very natural very organic if, if you have you know if you've had personal encounters with immigrants, you know, you know, sometimes they'll speak the language of the country they immigrated to. Other times, especially when it's with family or other immigrants and such, they will speak in the, the original language. So, yeah, it feels, or, or, you know, as is the case in this movie, sometimes if it's, they want to hide something from someone they don't think speaks Russian, they'll say it in Russian instead. And, yeah, um, there is some, like, expository dialogue. And definitely, you know, dialogue is not the, the strongest suit of Cronenberg. Although it's, you know, that's more visible when he's also writing, which he did not do here. But... No, like a lot of the the lines tend to feel like they make sense to the the characters in the situation and the movie. You know, I I would argue that every movie creates its own world, and in my opinion, it's more important that it's consistent to that world rather than it necessarily resembling reality very much. Now. The cinematography was handled by Peter Sushitsky, who has DP'd a bunch of other Cronenberg films, you know, including Maps to the Stars, Cosmopolis, Dangerous Method, History of Violence, Spider, Existence, Crash, M. Butterfly, Naked Lunch, Dead Ringers, um... Huh, I thought that was one. Anyway, yeah. So, you know, very much the, the you know, they have a very good working relationship to be working together so many times and across so many, like, ac across decades. Uh, you know, so the, yeah, like many other of Cronenberg's movies, the cinematography is fairly straightforward matter of fact you know there are a couple of of instances where it gets very like art artsy and and that sort of thing but yeah a lot of the time it's it's very straightforward and yeah one person said it looks like an hbo show there's nothing original in the style of it i remember seeing it thinking i was just watching cable and this is again i don't think that something being a movie means that it has to look cinematic and that's clearly not like I would be very critical of it if the movie did not do so much to make up for it in other areas you know it's just it's not something that Cronenberg is super interested in and yeah the the cinematography makes it easy to follow when something suddenly happens and the cinematography is not hyperactive when it should be more calm. There are no unnecessary shots. And yeah, it's very much, you know, the camera lets 
the action play out more than trying to stage it in a in a way that is very like visually Im impactful you know and I would say overall I prefer movies that are more visual you know I've, I've recently rewatched a bunch of Sam Raimi movies you know love his dynamic hyper hyperkinetic camera work you know but it wouldn't work for this sort of thing that's not at all what Cronenberg you know I, I don't yeah I, I wouldn't really say any of the Cronenberg movies that I've personally watched would really benefit from that kind of thing where you know with Sam Raimi it doesn't feel like oh it's just what he feels like no that's what he's doing it's it's part of the the overall stylistic you know yeah and yeah the editing was handled by Ronald Sanders who has also worked with, he you know he's edited a bunch of Cronenberg, uh, let's see, Maps to the Stars, Cosmopolis, A Dangerous Method, History of Violence, Spider, Existence, Crash, M. Butterfly, Naked Lunch, Dead Ringers, The Fly, The Dead Zone, Videodrome, and Scanner. Right, and yeah, um, so yeah, he's been again across decades they've been working together and he's been with him from very very early in in Cronenberg's career and yeah uh, the the um, the movie you you if you just look at it you might think that it has a slow pace and certainly it doesn't have like a fast pace but it really does, like, it's always establishing something or, or toying with something or letting events play out, you know. And, yeah, it's, it's difficult to edit something that is neither fast nor slow. It's not quite fast enough that you, like, there are people who will try to sit down and watch this with its not overwhelming running time and they won't be able to to get all the way through it you know so the yeah i i would argue the the pacing is nearly perfect though you know some stuff near the end did feel like it didn't completely need to be there but it's more a script issue than editing issue the movie had a budget of 50 million and a box office of 56.1 million. So, yeah, it is one of Cronenberg's numerous box office bombs that have, you know, have been appreciated by a, a number of people who are difficult to impress. But it did not, do, you know, he he's he doesn't really make very commercial films and I really admire that like you could so easily see, like in in the of, of the movies I've watched by him I would say the probably the closest he got was the fly and really it's not that commercial it's nowhere near like it absolutely was not what the studio would have preferred to, to like the you know, they would have loved for it to be this much more straightforward, you know, kind of kind of thing. And Cronenberg goes and does the body horror thing that he was known for at the time, less so in more recent years, recent decades. And yeah, the the fact that the the transformation can be read as a metaphor for stuff like cancer, stuff that changes your body in a way that's completely out of your control, like, really, really gutsy. Um, Cronenberg could easily have just said, well, you know, they gave me this thing that's, okay, I, let's make some money, let's, let's do this thing. But no, he made this much more intelligent, you know, it's, there's there's some cancer going on there's some drug addiction going on like he really did like 
the studio would probably have loved if it was like almost like a, a vigilantism film or like some sort of more like or or maybe like a werewolf thing some something a bit more you know but but no he made it very intense and that in of of the ones i've seen that is the closest he's come to being to just making a commercial film and yeah i i'm i'm very impressed that he keeps getting work because he loses money but you know just yeah despite the fact that he loses money but the yeah he keeps managing to to find people who appreciate that he makes interesting movies even if they're not necessarily financially viable now the this was filmed on part on uh, in in part on location including the the river thames which i grew up thinking was pronounced thames and yeah various places around london and yeah in including the you know there's some scenes at a, at a hospital since our protagonist is a maternity nurse and yeah they went to a hospital to to film at least some of it and let's see. Yeah, uh, Chelsea Football Club was also among the locations, and that's also, yeah, really adds to the the uh, authenticity. And let's see, yeah, so yes, the the set design. I uh, have a critic. Yeah, a couple of critic quotes here. There is mastery in every single shot. Observe the details. How the Russian heritage house Naomi Watts belongs to is decorated. How the Russian mafioso's restaurant is laid out. The atmosphere and decor in the yeah, places of prostitution and racket areas. And let's see. Yeah, one person said, This is by far the cleanest London I've ever seen on film. The characters, whom have done some despicable things between them, are often bathed in a warm yellow light from overhead, like a hovering halo in the night. In daytime, the streets are pristine. Cronenberg, to his credit, does not toss in a shot of Big Ben or the palace. Seriously. Maybe it's because he's not American. An American director will probably have, have done that, if, if nothing else, to shut up. The studio execs. We see the lavish, lavish restaurant front, the top layer, but not the bottom one. It is no surprise that the. Let's see. Right, that's a really good point, but it's actually yes. Um, yeah, it is no surprise that one particular scene has no such glow, but reeks of sterility until a certain thing yeah so yeah the music is handled by Howard Shore who has also worked with Cronenberg in in a number of other ones and you know yeah some of when, when you hear that name one of the things you think of is Lord of the Rings and yeah, he does very well here. You know, it's it's very soulful, with a strong sense of Russian identity. And yeah, one person said, you know, it was not overdone score. One user review said terrible background score. It's one of those things. I just wish. I wish they they defined what is terrible about it because I'm I'm really not sure what they're referring to but they are of course entitled to their opinion if they don't like it and let's see um, yeah briefly on pacing I think people today expect movies to move what I would call too 
fast, and there is this expectation that the story will go through a lot of changes over the course of it, and yeah, some people dislike this about this movie. I thought it was justified by the story and themes. You know, the, the movies that helped me appreciate pacing very different from American mainstream movies include The, the Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Barry Lyndon, Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris, and Andrei Rublev, Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. All of these were movies that my father showed me when I was a child and a teenager. If you're still young enough that you think you can adjust how you view the pacing of movies, or if you're a parent, while I would recommend that, you know, you look at some of the content of these movies before showing them to children, I do think they could work for you as well. This is this is very much a movie you're not necessarily going to have trouble figuring out where it's going and piecing together certain revelations that come fairly late into the movie and some consider that a weakness i think of it as essentially like a like a greek tragedy like one of those old stage plays where you know what's going to happen and you're just powerless as you watch it unfold before your eyes you know i think there's a lot of power in that and i i really admire anyone who's willing to make a movie like that today where we really have gotten obsessed with plot twists and big surprises and such. There are movies that really benefit from those sorts of things. I think that Christopher Nolan has made some incredible movies where, like, you really, it takes your breath away. You did not see this, that, and the other thing coming. But I don't think that that's, like, you can you can tell where a lot of this movie is going from very early on, and you're essentially sitting there thinking, please, please don't go that way. Please, somebody stop this from happening. And I'm not going to give away whether that eventually becomes the case, but that is definitely what it's going for, in my opinion. And if that sounds good to you, that's the kind of thing you know, and if it sounds bad, then this movie might be for you. And if it sounds bad for, to you, yeah, this movie is not for you. David Cronenberg does not make movies for everyone. He makes them for, you, you could say, niche audience, you know. And, you know, to, today when so many movies are, are trying to appeal to everyone, and trying to trying to have something for everyone in, in each movie and and some of them end up very bland and just not very daring you know I'm, I'm really glad that Cronenberg is, is still working now the movie is only 91 and a half minutes long without end credits 96 and a half long with them there's nothing in the you know you don't have to sit through the end credits and, yeah, I would definitely say it's worth the investment of time, well worth it. Uh, I can 100%, I forget if I, I read, if I saw someone actually saying this, I could imagine some people felt this was at least half an hour, maybe 45 minutes longer than it actually was. And, yeah, um, if you're not very interested in it, maybe 30 minutes in, the movie probably just isn't your kind of thing. And if you're used to, you know, Cronenberg's output in the 80s, yeah, this is nowhere near as, like, you know, there is some very, very intense gore, but it's not the, the, essentially the movie depicts some things that we've seen in a lot of other movies. It just depicts them in a more harsh, gory way than we're used to from, yeah, a lot of, of movies. But it's not, you know, like Videodrome and the Fly, in addition to the, the gore being intense, which is also, which it also is here, 
it's this kind of body horror and and like very creative like things that will never leave your mind you know once the <clears throat> they they live in your rent, in your head rent free for the rest of your life you you've never seen anything quite like it you know the this movie has nothing like that and you know that is the thing that some some people have really hated about his more recent output you know to to my knowledge i again i haven't watched all of them but the it yes i've I should say, the one I watched that was that seemed like a tipping point was Naked Lunch. That was that one has very creative, like practical special effects, practical effects, but it's not the kind of it's in in that it's more like off-putting. It's not the kind of like horrifying thing that we were used to. That you know, yeah. The last time I saw him do that was in The Fly. You know, Existence is is the the last of them where the the gore gets very creative and like really messes with your mind. As as far as I've, again, I think I think he changed back in Crimes of the Future. I I believe that is. A, a return to classic Cronenberg, but but yeah, these more recent ones, you know, Spider has almost no real violence. There's a couple of really strong implied things, but it's really not. You know, this uh, and a history of violence have some intense gory violence, but it's not the kind of creative stuff, and they're not really horror movies anymore. You know, the the. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let's see, was Dead Ringers, was that a horror movie? That one's listed as a horror movie, so that might have been the last, like, regular horror movie he made before. Let's see, is Crimes of the Future? Yeah, Crimes of the Future is listed as horror, so. But yeah, uh, the best elements, in my opinion, of this, uh, the, the, um, the depiction of this, macho world that's stuck in the past the the way that there is this separation between regular london and russian mob ruled london and this thing of you know basically anna has russian heritage her father was russian but she's not used to dealing with like the mafia you know so she's sort of like, she's perhaps the closest you can get to someone who can walk both worlds, at least somewhat. You know, she she holds her own in, in some of these very tense situations. And the worst aspect is probably that it was not... Honestly... Yeah, I don't... Hmm, let's see. Overall, probably the fact that, you know, they 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 really should have cast Russian actors. You know, Cronenberg is not someone who only goes for actors who are, like, really in the spotlight. He's not someone who, like, always puts someone in, his, in the lead of his movies that audiences are like in love with or something so if they they could have gone out you know Cronenberg's name by itself sells a lot of his movies for audiences and really the the mainstream audiences who go to see his movies to see like imagine going to this movie if to you Viggo Mortensen means Lord of the Rings like his character here like there's a, 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 both of them have some 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 rough edges and and there's something like underneath but other than that they're nothing alike you know imagine if the the let's see yeah if you you know if you looked at you you saw Armin Mueller Stahl's name and it was like oh you know that that kindly old man from from this and that movie 
yeah, this this would absolutely not, you know, work for you. Honestly, if you went to this movie to see Vincent Cassell being Vincent Cassell, yeah, fair enough. That's absolutely what, you know. Do I sound like I don't like, I love his work. I'm not saying, I just, it, it's just... I don't know. I just I kind of do love that he's one of those actors where I don't think I've ever seen him. Like I've seen him in American, I've seen him in this Canadian, I've seen him in French movies. He always I I don't think I've ever seen him play someone who wasn't this hothead who gets himself into trouble because he makes rash decisions, you know. And it 100% it works for the character. You you over the course of the movie, you come to understand why he's like that. And, yeah, something I saw a lot of other people say they really didn't like was the, they felt that it was, you know, too slow in, in pacing. And, yeah, I've already addressed that. The thing I was most worried about was a sophomore slump for a cronenberg Mortensen you know, collaboration. And this absolutely was not the case. And the thing I was most looking forward to was more Cronenberg and... Yeah, you know, once once you adjust to this being how he makes, you know, for for a while, I, I guess maybe, he, I, I don't know if Crimes of the Future 2022 is going to be the last he makes like that, or if he is just going back to that, but yeah, for, for a while here, you know, from, from the 90s through like 20, what was it, 2015, 16, something like that, I'll have it momentarily... Uh, 20, 2014, that's right. Uh, you know, yeah, this was the way he, he made movies. Very different in, in certain ways from what he used to do, but... And, yeah, so the, the trailers give at least a little bit too much away. Um, I do think that they could have gotten the audience interest without spoiling, but I do understand... They, the trailers the trailers don't really give you that good of an idea of what the movie is like. Um, it's very difficult to make a trailer for a Cronenberg movie that both like gives you an idea of what the movie's like and sells it because his movies it's very difficult to sum up in like two and a half minutes how a Cronenberg movie because it's not it's not really like that like it's honestly I guess if anything they should almost release as as trailers for these movies like the opening credits sequence that gives that very quickly gives you an idea of what the movie's gonna be like but that's not gonna be you know that's not what the American trailer viewing audience wants so yeah it's it's very difficult this one is not as bad like the the one uh, the video drum holy crap that just they had no idea what to do they just like well i mean it's it's about technology and these are the actors uh let's let's can we do something with that no no you can't not not something that'll make sense at least and yeah this is yeah the the trailers make the movie look much more commercial much more fast paced the the cover and poster do not give too much away and i the an argument could be made that if you like the you know that the yeah that the poster and cover give you a good idea of what the movie is like you know it's yeah it's it's very difficult to completely get across but yeah several of yeah there's there's multiple several of them feature at least one shot of Viggo Mortensen and one shot of um, Naomi Watts that's it uh, and yeah ADHD acting up there and yes I do actually have that diagnosis I realize some people use it without anyway um, and certainly the relationship between the two of them is very important it's not just like look look who we cast you know 
the yeah so so that's definitely and and several of them also show these tattooed hands of one of the russian mobsters and that also that really tells you a lot about that that gives you an, a, a sense of the world that it is uh, yeah and yeah, um, some of the covers and posters are worth looking up on IMDb. At least if you if you really love the movie, I would say. Now, when I search on YouTube, I found five clips here on YouTube. I found five clips, one uh, two trailers, one TV spot, five music videos, including fan ones, six review analysis, two documentaries, two reactions, and a partridge in a pear tree. So this is not a hugely covered movie, despite the fact, like, YouTube was around, I'm pretty sure, let's see, when did, I'll, I'll have it momentarily, I'm pretty sure YouTube was around when this movie first came out, so the, yeah, yeah, launched 2005, which kind of tells you, you know, yeah, this movie was not that, you know, it it wasn't a movie that people were like falling all over to to get to you know the you know comparatively there's tons of videos on 300 including ones that date back to at least not long after it came out you know that that movie came out one year prior to this and both are you know about macho worlds so you know but that one is significantly more commercial and pro fascist sadly so on rotten tomatoes this has an 89% on the tomato meter based on 203 reviews only 22 of them rotten and an 83 audience score based on over 100,000 ratings. And the average critic rating is 7.60 out of 10. The average user rating is 3.9 out of 5. So, yeah, certified fresh. And actually, you know, it, it found its audience, which I'm very, very glad to, to see. On Metacritic, it has an 82 based on 35 critic reviews universal acclaim and the user score is 7.1 out of 10 based on 325 ratings now there are See on on IMDb there are 481 user reviews or 344 if you hide spoilers. I oh that's right yeah I actually yeah I ended up reading all of them since there's yeah normally I read the top voted 100 but when there's that few and it's a movie I love yeah so the the top voted 100 seven people gave it a 1 out of 10, one person gave it a 2, 4 gave it a 3, 3 gave it a 4, 4 gave it a 5, 9 gave it a 6, 13 gave it a 7, 24 gave it an 8, 22 gave it a 9, and 14 gave it a 10. So again, it definitely found its audience. And there are 297 links in the IMDb external reviews section. So yeah, that is pretty good for and yeah it has a 7.6 out of 10 on IMDb based on 256,000 ratings 35.9 percent gave it 8 26.4 gave it 7 15.2 gave it 9 8.9 gave it 6 8.2 gave it 10 2.9 gave it 5 1.1 gave it 4 1, uh, 0 0.6 gave it 1 0 0.5 gave it 3 0 0.3 gave it 2 so yes, this movie, <coughs> this movie very much found its audience. Right then we have the, yeah, it was nominated for one Oscar. It was 
Yeah, it won 28 awards and was nominated for 74 total. So, you know, <coughs> the people who give out awards, a lot of critics and other filmmakers and such really, really loved this movie. It just didn't have as much, like, mass appeal. It, hence the box office. Now, the, the effects are, once again, practical and very, very impressive. Um, they are not as... Um, the camera doesn't rest on them for quite as long, which, you know, that, yeah, that was the kind of thing that, by this point in his career, Cronenberg wasn't doing, you know, again, this is nothing like Videodrome or The Fly in that regard. And, yeah, the, the special effects are incredibly convincing. And, yeah, um, I agree that some of the things this movie shows are extreme. I agree that it makes watching the movie not be a pleasant experience, but I disagree that it means that we can't feel things from the movie, or that the only thing you can feel is disgust. It's possible for a movie to run into that, whether intentionally or otherwise. No Cronenberg movie that I've seen, you know... Yeah, does that, although I have heard that his most recent Crimes of the Future does do that. And I certainly, I do find that a credible, yeah, I can I can absolutely see that. Because some of these movies he really does barely hold back. But, but yeah, this is definitely a movie where you will see some incredibly messed up stuff, you know, happen and be done. And some of the people doing it really seem blasé about it, which of course makes it that much more upsetting to, to see. But again, I would argue that all of the violence in the movie serves a purpose. Uh, if it's not for you, it's not for you, and I would definitely... I, I don't think we should be pressuring people to watch something that has violence if they don't like it. I don't think we should be, like, banning it either, but, you know, I'm I'm a big believer in making it publicly available how much, how intense it is, which, you know, I think the IMDb Parents Guide is a great tool in, in that department. And, let's see, yeah, there's some really, really excellent stunts as well. And it is definitely a hard R. And I think... I think that might just about. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah. So. Um, yes. Uh, I'm. I'm putting a couple of links in the description box for stuff to to watch and read that helps. Yeah, that it's, you know stuff that I think where they really have something interesting to say about the movie. So the the DVD, my version has ten and a half minute behind the scenes called Secrets and Stories, which is you know general kind of behind the scenes, and a seven and a half minute featurette called Marked for Life, which is a behind the scenes specifically about the the tattoos. And, yeah, they're, they're both good. I think at least one of them is now on... Yeah, the... the uh, let's see. Is that the full one, though, if it's on? Huh. Okay, uh, yeah, part of the, the, the Mark for Life one is on... YouTube, which actually makes me wonder if that's entirely, huh? You know what? I've, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into if that's. I don't want to be linking to something that should not be on YouTube, but yeah, the <clears throat> I wouldn't really say that. You know, it's not necessary to own the DVD if. 
you know, it's it's really only if you want to be able to watch it anytime. But it's not one of those DVDs. You know, maybe there's other versions of DVDs, but uh, Blu-ray or something for releases for it. But yeah, the the one I know, the one I own, you know, it, I I got it on sale. You know, if you can get it on sale and you want to have a copy, sure. But don't go out of your way to to watch. Like if you're if you're gonna go out of your way to get a the the home release of a Cronenberg movie, you know, make it the, I don't want to show this to the camera because sometimes that messes up the, the autofocus, but the, the steel case two disc release of the fly, which includes an audio commentary by Cronenberg for the entire film and a two hour documentary called fear of the flesh, the making of the fly. That's the one you want to go out of your way to to own if you if you care about that movie in Cronenberg. Now, yes, I rank this. I, I rate this eight chilling looks at the Russian mafia out of ten. And yeah, uh, the movie absolutely holds up. I think this is a movie that might be. Uh, now that you know now that Russia has invaded Ukraine I think this is a movie that might get I, I, this is not why I did it I'm just I'm doing videos on all the Cronenberg movies I have access to but yeah you know I, I think this helped underline not necessarily that your average Russian is a bad person but which I really don't think is the case but that they do have a culture that is very harsh which you know if you if you look at their history it makes a lot of sense you know they were invaded multiple times you know the the that's part of why they fought so hard in world war 2 they did not want that to happen again you know and yeah, it's it's made them very very harsh as a culture. But there are, you know, there are plenty of individual Russians who are great people. There's tons of Russians who are not at all in support of what Putin is doing. But you know, he, it's a dictatorship. He he's very brutal towards those who peacefully protest. And. Yeah. Um, yes, and and it's a movie. I'm I'm very very glad that the movie got the the positive reception that overall it did get, albeit not at the box office. So yes, my my ranking worst to best, which once again does not mean you know these are all movies that I love, but all of the Cronenberg movies that I've watched, including this one, worst to best. The Brood, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, and Videodrome. And I think that, yes, that brings us into the spoiler section, the thoughts sections. So let's dive in with notes taken while watching on paper as per usual and yeah so once again from here on out I will be spoiling everything in this movie so click away if you haven't already watched so yeah we we see you know this the 16 year old has to to cut this throat and he actually has to saw through it which you know I, as far as I understand, that is, you know, very accurate, very realistic. And there's a lot of American movies that, you know, basically want you to think that violence is easy and cool. And I'm not saying that there are no, like, I enjoy some of the movies that that have something like that. But I really appreciate that Cronenberg wants you to feel the violence. He he doesn't want it to be fun or cool or easy and yeah the as as far as i know it is accurate you can't you know in a, in a lot of movies it'll it'll just be like 
and and immediately effective. But here, like he has to like saw to get through, you know. And yeah, the 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 couple of of um I don't remember what the yeah the the veins that are in in the in the neck and and you know that if you manage to to cut or or shoot open or something like that you you'll bleed out very very quickly yeah they are thick you know if they weren't they you know they wouldn't be very much they wouldn't be much good to the body and Let's see. Yeah, and you know, this is a guy he just met. You know, and yeah, the the um, I think his name is Azim, but you know, the the father of you know, uh, hold on, Ekrem. Yeah, you know, Ekrem is the sixteen year old, and he's you know, he's excitable enough. He wants to go out shopping for Christmas presents. You know. Here he is, the kid I was talking about. Ah, oh, can you believe this guy? You know, and and the other guy tries to shake his hand, and Ekrem, you know, at first it seems like shyness, but it might also be he doesn't want to shake the hand of someone he's about to slit the throat of. You know, and yeah, the the you know, I I appreciate that it takes a little while before we realize why this happened, or even really who gave the order. And, yeah, and then we, you know, very shortly after we see this, you know, underage prostitute, you know, die in, in front of us and, and just, yeah, very, very harsh. And, you know, thankfully the baby does survive, you know, which, which honestly, I think, you know, if, with it being so close to Christmas, and like this this mother that no one thinks much of having a baby and not having a good place to you know she goes and asks for help you know if this if this baby didn't make it there would be a lot of christians walking out of the movie being like that was probably the second coming i am pissed and let's see yeah and and yeah you know she, anna takes the the journal and you know her her uncle keeps mentioning keeps underlining you know you should you know you do you often steal from the dead do you know that your daughter steals from the dead you shouldn't steal from the dead you know the, just yeah and then we have the yeah the first time that anna comes across nikolai in the first of many you know they keep intersecting without like it it's fairly late into the film before they have a conversation you know for a while like she'll maybe ask him something and he'll say i'm just a driver you know or the yeah there's there's various things but yeah it's only really it's by the end of the movie they they come to trust each other but yeah this first time you know, Nikolai suggests, you know, maybe she's a prostitute, which I appreciate, like, that kind of puts us on the, on the, on the back foot, on the defensive, because we like her. We've just seen her try to save this teenage girl's life. You know, it's, it's very, you know, but over the course of the movie, we come to, to trust Nikolai a little more, and by the end of the movie, I kind of get the sense that the reason Nikolai said that was in part to make sure that Kirill didn't think much of her. Because Nikolai, you know, we later learn, well, he's, you know, FSB. He probably has an, like, he, he looks at her and he's like, she doesn't belong here. There's something wrong here. You know, I better make sure that the others don't pay too much attention to her because they are going to kill her to keep these secrets you know so he's like ah oh, look prostitute you know so that Kirill won't think and and you know I, I do think Nikolai at this point already knows very well that Kirill is a, a gay man which again 
I, I don't think the movie's saying there's something wrong with that. And obviously, in real life, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being gay or bi or pan or, you know. The, the, but Semyon and the entire Russian conservative, you know, these, these conservative immigrants, which many immigrants, you know, they, they are very conservative because they've basically, you know, they've, they've left their country. All they have left are these traditional values. So, yeah, the, they're sometimes much more conservative than, I always forget, is it called native-born? People who are not immigrants, you know. And... See. Yeah, and and you know, Semyon asks for Anna's father's name, and you know, it's it's. Uh, oh, hold on, I had it written down. Oh. Her father's name is Ivan, which makes her Ivanovna, which. I'm going to go ahead and guess either means kin of, you know, offspring of, or, or specifically daughter of Ivan, which again, you know, that's the, that's the traditional, you know, yeah, it's, uh, I, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but for a while at least. Russian naming convention, as far as I understand, uh, you know what, I, just in case, I believe, as far as I've heard, Russian naming convention is that the last name, it's, it's like how if you're the son of John, you're John's son, you know, it's, it's that kind of naming convention. And... I really love that Semyon is clearly very cultured. Like he's he's great with food, and he knows how to play this uh, violin, you know. But he's also capable of of a lot of cruelty, as we see later in the in the film. And note the tone shift the moment that she says. You know, I'm having, you know, as soon, I'll have answer, I'll have more answers as soon as I have her journal translated. Like, those few words, 100% he turns, and it's this great subtle thing. Like, imagine if he, like, whipped around and shouted at her, get me that journal or something. That's not going to get him the result he wants, you know. So, instead, he, like, tries to apply a little bit of pressure, but... We, the audience, and really Anna herself, can tell there's something, you know, he really does not want this diary out there. And, yeah, at the, at the dinner table, you know, they, yeah, the, the uncle, Uncle Stepan, oh, that's right, yeah, I do appreciate, he is actually, let's see, he's, he's Polish, he's not Russian, but, they did find at least one person to, to... So they were aware that it was a, an option to, to get someone who wasn't... Anyway, um... A, a Western European, I mean. Anyway, the... the um, yeah, you know, he asks, why isn't your boyfriend here? And Anna says, you know, we're not... We don't live together anymore. So, you know, really, the the... Um, Every, every major character in this is in some way, you know, targeted by this very conservative, macho culture. You know, like, imagine having to, to sit there and be interrogated by your uncle at dinner. Like, you know, it, like, hypothetically, let's say that he found her, like, crying her eyes out, maybe talking about self-harm or something. And then he's like, where's your boyfriend? Why isn't he taking care of you? Then, okay, fair enough. It's, you know, he, him being like, you know, we sh I should know where he is, you know. But it's dinner, you know. There's no, like, but but that's that's the culture. That's this conservative culture. 
you know, he feels that he's entitled to this information and, you know, he's racist saying, you know, black people always leave their, their, you know, loved ones. And then he says, it's not natural for the races to mix. This is why you lost your baby, which just, holy crap. But yeah, again, this is sadly what, you know, a number of conservatives do believe, immigrant and otherwise. Let's see, and I, I like that Ekrem is so excited that he got tickets for the game. Like He's like, hey, and, you know, Nikolai, like, grabs him by the throat because he's like, oh, surprise, it's a, you know, yeah, surprise attack or something. Like, it's, you know, and, and um, I, I believe Azim, but Ekrem's father, at least. And he's like, okay, um, go watch a DVD, you know. And... Yeah, so they yeah they put the body on ice, and yeah, uh, Nikolai needs a hair dryer to to thaw it up, which is just one of the really gnarly details here. And yeah, you know he he takes away the identifying you know he removes the teeth, he cuts off all of all ten fingernails, you know, and. Yeah, this is this is a way to prevent a positive identification of him. And yeah, the detail that he like he himself is like eh, whatever, you know. And he like he tells Ekram's father leave the room. This is, you know. And and he also tells Kirill get get out. You don't need to be here for this. But he himself, you know, he like takes the cigarette, puts it down on his tongue, you know, Actually, yeah, I think he like drops it on the um he threw it on the ground and then just goes about it like it's nothing. And let's see. Yeah, and, and he, you know, Kirill says, Are you sure this is the best the, are you sure you wanna we wanna dump the body here? And Nikolai says, This is the best place to dump a body. Which is such a it's such a perfect line because I don't think he's technically lying. He just doesn't say why it's the perfect place to dump a body and under which circumstances it's the perfect place. Because Kirill hears that and he's like, you're, you know, you're the expert. Let's do this. He assumes this is the perfect place to dump a body if you don't want it found but what Nikolai you know what he doesn't say what he's thinking is this is the perfect place to dump a body to make sure it's found you know because you know later there's the line you know okay Pro progress report via dumped body I haven't seen that one before you know he specifically wanted to make sure that that this was and and yeah you know the 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 tattoos on the body tell a story. That's you know this is something. This is one of the first things the the cop says once he sees the body. And later we see them read Nikolai's tattoos when he become when he gets his stars. You know so yeah this is a it's a it's a very effective way to communicate to the the cop. You know it's going down. You know, people are important. People are being killed by the the mob, and and I yeah, I really appreciate the this fact that like Nikolai does take advantage of Kirill's trust, which of course he has to in order to be an effective FSB agent here. If he's gonna be much use undercover, yeah, he needs the trust of of some you know. And and clearly Semyon, there's no love lost there. He was willing to sacrifice him to save Kirill. And and that's another thing, you know, at the end of the movie, Kirill is still alive. Semyon had, you know, let's see, they took his blood. They're very, I don't think we see him be arrested, but you know that's gonna happen very very soon. You know that's also that's why the the baby. That's why. He, Kirill was sent to, to kill the baby, so they don't have the DNA evidence. 
of, of the baby, but yeah, you know, not long after the end of the movie, Semyon is going to be arrested, the, you know, Kirill is going to take over for him, and Nikolai has so much sway over him, he's not going to have trouble getting Kirill out of the picture. Maybe, maybe he tricks him into doing something that he's arrested for, maybe, honestly, I wouldn't rule out that, like, you know, the, the Chechens, that they're gonna get this, you know, they're, yeah, they're gonna find out, well, you know, the two guys we sent were, were killed in there, maybe they find out that it was Nikolai who killed them, maybe they think it was Kirill, either way, they want, you know, they, yeah, they want blood for blood, they're, they're gonna want, you know, and if Nikolai can maneuver it so that Kirill is the one who ends up dead, if, if Nikolai is the one they want, you know, yeah, it's, it's very, you, you can easily see how it, it is, and, and it is this, like, it feels paradoxical, but yeah, you know, this undercover agent, if he's able to reach the very top of a crime family, he can do a lot of good. You know, I, I, throughout the movie, the police are not involved very much. You know, there, there is this implication that they can't really accomplish much because the, the Russians, you know, have so much power and are so entrenched. It, it takes something really significant for the, the, um, yeah. And then we have the, um, yeah, and yeah, so Anna brings these, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, copy, yeah, copies from the, of the text of the book to Semyon, who's like, what about the original? You know, he, he would very much like, and she's like, oh, I, I think I'll, I'll keep that, and, you know, and he's like, once I've translated this for you, I can come to your home to hand deliver it. You know, she's like, it's, I'll, I'll just pick it up, it's okay. And then he's like, you know, he's, he keeps trying to get the information on where she lives, which, you know, she of course realizes this is not. And, and again, like, you could understand if she was like, how, you can't ask me where I live, that's completely unacceptable. But she knows that this would, you know, it, they're essentially playing chess, you know, they, uh, poker, they're playing poker, they have to not show their hand. And then we have the yeah we we see that Stepan did manage to to translate at, at least some of it and yeah really really harsh stuff that's that's in there and yeah so when Kirill and Nikolai are at this you know, strip club or, or whatever exactly it is, the sex workers themselves, like, they could not look more miserable. Like, there's, you know, they just, they really don't want to, and, and there's this one that's, like, pole dancing, basically, and, like, Kirill keeps trying to go up to her, and she keeps trying to avoid him, you know, it's, like, it's not that she logically thinks she can avoid him forever, but she just wants to put it off for as long as at all possible, you know. It's not one of those that say, oh, you know, and, and, and to be, to be clear, not every sex worker in real life is unhappy. The ones who have some independence and some control over their, you know, working situation, some of them are very happy with it. It's much like any other kind of work. It's, like, for some reason, we... A lot of us get weird the moment that sex is involved. But, like, sex work and, like, other kinds of service work, you know, for some people, it is unique, and I, I acknowledge, you know, there is obviously, you know, at least some people's experience of sex is to feel a strong attachment to 
the person they're having sex with. There's an exchange of hormones and such. But for a lot of people, that's just not, you know, yeah, it's, it's a job, you know. But people who have been trafficked, very frequently miserable. And, let's see... Yeah, and and yeah, Kirill is is furious. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, he keeps trying. To, he keeps pressuring Nikolai. Uh, you know, at at first he says, "Let's pick one that will fuck," and then he settles on, "You are going to fuck one of these girls." Uh, you know, and and he says, "Do it in front of me to prove that you're not gay," and. There's a lot of evidence in the film that Kirill is gay. I've, I've already made clear, I do believe that he is. Note that he doesn't himself seem that interested in the, se the, the sex. You know, first he says, we'll, you know, we'll fuck one together. Which, you know, if he's gay, but he has to hide that, and he's maybe attracted to Nikolai, that's one way that he can be close to having sex with Nikolai if they have sex with the same girl. And, you know, yeah, he, he settles on, you have sex with, with the girl in front of me while I watch. And, you know, he claims it's to prove that Nikolai isn't gay, but in reality, it's him, you know, he's basically fantasizing about having sex with Nikolai. So, you know, it, it is this thing of, like, the, the movie shows, you know, people who are gay in a culture that it isn't accepted, they're not, not going to be gay, they're just going to be angry and, and bitter and, and, like, trying to find some way to, to act out the, their gay desires, you know. Gay people, the LGBTQ plus community are not inherently less happy they're just less happy when people deny them civil rights which you know like a, a white conservative straight cis man is gonna like grab a gun or make a bomb if you tell him to pay taxes it takes like the the lgbtq plus community really they're a lot of them are very happy if they if people just get out of their way and just let them live their lives they're not forcing themselves on other people again the vast majority of of rapists are straight and cis now let's see yeah and you know i appreciate that you know it's it's very clear that no you know Nikolai, the girl he's having sex with, and Kirill, none of them are that happy about the sex. Like, Nikolai knows, Nikolai knows that Kirill is gay, and that this is something Kirill wants to, to you know, for, to, to fantasize about. You know, obviously the girl doesn't want it, she's forced into this, she was tricked into this situation, and is being forced to, to stay there. And Kirill, you know, he would prefer to actually have sex with Nikolai. And there's a it's a great detail that afterwards the the you know one of the uh, yeah afterwards she's you know singing sadly and we we get this line from the journal you know they I'm I was told that if I sing at this restaurant what was it? I can make more money in a month that mo than my father made in a year, or something like that. You know, that's how each of these women ended up there. They were they were tricked. They were told they just had to sing. And yeah, very very creepy when Semyon shows up at the hospital, uh, you know, and and gets very close to Anna, and and yeah, you know. He's he can he can imply threats to the people that would close the doors to him so that they open the doors for him instead. 
And yeah, the the book, the journal reveals Kirill attempted to, to rape Tatiana, but was unable to, so uh, Semyon did. And yeah, you know, that's sadly very common for uh, sex trafficking is that they are raped before they're, you know, yeah being yeah being being used by by uh, customers and that's another thing I will definitely say about you know the the contrived setup they don't even really attempt to explain why the pills didn't work like there's just there's a line in the journal about they gave me some pills to to take care of the pregnancy but it didn't work and it's like I mean I wouldn't have hated another another draft there if they could have just because there's like there's stuff you could say, you know. Um, I can imagine that's one of the cases where if the pill you you take is is like too old, it might not work. There's a lot of medication that doesn't that loses its potency after a while. You know, let's if Kirill was in charge, maybe he bought it from some someone who's been selling pills that are too old, you know, or, I don't know, I guess, could there be a thing about, like, she she couldn't, you know, she a after the rape, after, you know, she takes the pills and then they leave, and then she throws up because of her disgust at what happened, and that gets rid of the pill, you know, it, it wouldn't have been very difficult. And... Yeah, um, Stepan claims that he was KGB, which Anna insists he wasn't, and he says, I was an auxiliary. Aux auxil yeah. That's as many attempts as I'm going to make pronouncing that word. And let's see. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, Semyon talks about, you know, he he's aware of them slitting the throat of, of that guy and, and points out, you know, that guy has brothers. And yeah, and Nikolai meets Anna's family and yeah, they do such a great job with the tension because, you know, once you've watched, yeah, on a first viewing, you're just like, well, he's clearly there for the journal, you know, he's, he's hoping to, you know, but on rewatch you know he is also trying part of the reason he's trying to get the book back is that he wants to make sure that the what's the word he wants to make sure that the you know he he knows that he can you know take out Semyon and Kirill but he doesn't think that the journal can be kept away from from Semyon. And yeah, the we get the the detail that I'm afraid I forget the the Soika, that was his name. Uh, you know, oh, and he's actually also let's see. He's Bosnian, so, you know, there are a couple of people that were like geographically from almost from Russia but but yeah uh, the the Soika s claimed that Kirill was gay and Kirill unable to change the fact that he's gay but worried about the the outcome if it becomes common knowledge if his father becomes aware of it yeah he kills you know this is this he's literally sh killing the messenger you know soika so so yeah the two things soika apparently said about kirill was that he was a drunk and he was gay and yeah there's he's definitely a drunk and there's a lot of evidence that he's gay so yeah, you know, this is this is what happens. You know, again, it's not that gay people kill people who... It's actually more often the other way around. 
but you know, um, homophobes, murder gay people. But but when you, yeah, when you have someone with this much power, I mean, essentially, Kirill is supposed to one day rule. I'm not even gonna attempt. It's let's see the the. No, I I would I would butcher the pronunciation, but he's supposed to run this entire family, and. If, if people know that he's gay, they might not respect him. And a leader that isn't respected in this kind of world is completely powerless. So, yeah, he's, he's you know, rashly killing the, this guy who, who's been saying, you know, that he's gay, not thinking about the fact that there might be revenge for that. And that's also a, a, a thing, like, throughout the movie, blood begets blood, which is, sadly, you know, there's a, a lot of people, and I, I appreciate it can be cathartic in fiction, but there's, sadly, still a number of people who believe that in real life, revenge is something that is going to help help you feel better about the, the loss, which, you know, the, the, there's a lot of witness statements and studies that show that's just not the case. You know, the, but, but yeah, this film accurately shows, no, if, if you kill someone, the, that person, is, the, the, that person's loved ones might try to kill you or your loved ones, you know, throughout the film, the, the, you know, Semyon raped Tatiana, which ends up getting him arrested and, and starts Anna on the entire, you know, yeah. Uh, the the yeah. Ekrem kills Soika on the order of Kirill. Later Ekrem is killed and they attempt to kill Kirill. They just they go for Nikolai instead, not knowing what Kirill looks like. You know, basically all of the violence throughout the entire movie starts with this ma macho culture, this insecurity, male ins male fragility. And, you know, that, I, I would say male fragility is the cause of a huge chunk of the unnecessary pain and misery. It, you can't prevent all of it, but you should prevent all that you can. And, yeah. And that's not saying, oh, you know, all men are bad. No, it's saying we should try to address male fragility instead of, you know, encouraging fragile men to join fascist organizations. And let's see, then we have the... Yeah, they have the point, you know, it's no longer KGB, it's FSB now. You know, there's, there's several times in the movie where someone will say a thing and someone else will say, that's not true anymore, or, you know, now that's a completely different thing, or, you know, they haven't really changed with the times. And... Let's see... Yeah, and, um... Yeah, uh, Nikolai is told Stepan has to die for what he knows. And we have the great line, there's a lot of villains around. And, yeah, Nikolai yet again says, I'm just a driver, to, to try to avoid getting further involved. Which, you know, by the end we realize, yeah, because it's, it's not that he's apathetic, though, you know, he, he plays that act very well throughout a lot of the film. No, it's that he... Is worried. You know, he's basically thinking long term. He's he's thinking big picture, not small picture. And let's see. Yeah, and and Ekrem has his throat slit as he's peeing on a gravestone. And yeah, it's for Soika. And again. I say this, ah, I should have said that earlier, 
when I say Ekrem might be on the spectrum, I'm not saying that as like a negative. I, I actually, yeah, I hope I hope that came across earlier because I did say, you know, it didn't feel like stereotypical or something. But yeah, this thing of like he's, you know, the the there's even a cop who says, okay, calm, calm down, okay, please, you know, because yeah, you know, Ekrem is cheering for one team while surrounded by supporters of the other team and he's in England so this could end very badly you know there there are hooligans around and you know he keeps let's see I think he says Chelsea or something and someone else is like wanker and he just keeps doing it because you know some people on the spectrum struggle with these like social cues you know like even if you really love your sports bowl team maybe don't cheer their name while you're surrounded by angry fans of the other sports bowl team you know that's not the most safe thing to yeah and and yeah like the the attack on him is actually fairly public you know there's all these you know soccer hooligans very close by which you know that's a that's a yeah, over the course of, of the movie, the violence intensifies. You know, early on, you know, okay, the, the like, Ekrem goes into this, this um, barber shop, and he turns around the sign, closed. No one's going to come in there, so they, they kill him there. And that's also, you know, that's their barber shop, so they, you know, they know, they, they control this area, you know, no one's going to, they're not doing it at someone else's workplace and then have to, you know hide a body from someone who works there no they're you know I can imagine there's other people who do work there but you know Ekram's father sent them home and they probably know that if they show up without having been asked to show up they're gonna be in a lot of trouble and they almost definitely know that he's mafia you know and let's see the yeah you know later we have this very public killing of Ekram by the end, it's in this bathhouse where, like, hypothetically, anyone could walk in, you know. Let's see, and... Yeah, then we have the... Um... Yeah, uh, the... Yeah, um... Simeon tells uh, Kirill, you know, go into the, the cellar. And he's like, what? Nikolai, go into the cellar. No, Kirill, go into the cellar and take your time. Let's see. And, uh, yeah, well, while, uh, you know, Nikolai is, is up there, he's offered stars and accepts them. And, you know, Kirill... I would say bless his heart if he wasn't such a bastard. He's like, so, well, to help with the bottles up. <laughs> and Nikolai has to tell him, your father does not need bottles anymore. He has perfected zero-G technology, and it is frankly much more convenient to store the wine like that. And then we have the... Yeah, Nikolai goes in, you know, before he gets the the stars, he has to pass some some tests, and you know they they say to him something like, "You have no you, your father was weak for working with the government. You have no mother." Something like that, you know, stuff that like if he's not devoted enough, that's gonna get a reaction. He's gonna be like, "Fuck you! Don't you talk about my parents like that?" And then he's not, you know. You know, crap material. You know, so let's see. And yeah, we learn that the the um, uncle Stepan is now missing, and let's see the. Yeah, I will say it's it's quite the relief that it turns out. Yeah, it was the the uh, what's the word? 
you know, um, it was exile rather than death, or death by exile. And I think that, uh, right, and yeah, the yeah. So the the business meeting at the the bathhouse, and yeah, and and you know, Ekram's father goes out and says, you know, Kirill is in there. You'll know him by the stars. So that was why they gave him stars, just to to sacrifice him, to to save Kirill, and. Very very brutal fight. Um, I I love it's it's like with you know at least some I won't give away for the fights in a history of violence. It doesn't not every like the the choreography feels very realistic, very authentic. It's not that every single. Not every not every punch lands the way that the you know the person hoped that it would and yeah um, Viggo Mortensen does get hurt he doesn't just walk away without again there's so many American movies where the good guy or antihero or something is just able to you know he he he's so fast or so good at at dodging or or you know, blocking attacks or something that he never gets hurt. And that's not at all the case here. Like, he gets hurt. He gets, like, sliced, I think, maybe three times, you know, and it comes very close to them killing him. And when he's sliced, like with other Cronenberg, you know, movies, it hurts. It's not just like, ah, you know, I'm even more determined now. You know, no, it's like, fuck, that is, you know, that... Like, at one point, he's on the ground, he's barely able to get back up, you know, so, yeah, really appreciate it. And, and the, yeah, it feels like it hurts us to see, also because the places they, you know, some of it is in, like, the back, I think, at one point, it's like the, I, I can never remember what it's called, but, like, if you have the knee, like, on the other side of the knee, on under side of the leg, something like that you know, it just, yeah, places that really hurt, and, you know, yeah, he managed, one of the guys, he stabs in the eye, and one of them, he, like, stabs in the chest, and then the guy pulls out the blade, just, yeah, and then we have, um, yeah, and, yeah, Anna v visits Nikolai in the hospital, and it's not to be like, I'm so sorry you're hurt, it's to get answers, and, yeah, he explains, you know, um, Stepan is in Scotland, in a five-star hotel. He flew there first class. And, yeah, then we get the, the thing about the dumping the body as progress report, which I really, I've... I did not at all see the twist coming, that Nikolai was FSB this whole time. And, yeah, he, you know, Nikolai tells the, the cop, you know, you can take Semyon in for rape. Let's see. Yeah, and, and Kirill talks to one of the little kids, and, you know, the, the kid overheard the, the arguing. And Kirill is like, it's not a fight if, if you don't hit back. Which is one hell of a thing to tell this, like, I don't know, seven-year-old or something. It just, yeah. And... Yeah, then we see Christine. Christin E. is missing. And, you know, I, I do appreciate, like, Kirill, even for Kirill, this is, this is very far. And he's, he's struggling to, to do it. And he's like, you know, forgive me for this lackluster Moses cosplay. But yeah, um, Nikolai and Anna do get there just in time. Good thing Nikolai fixed the bike. And the, the, yeah, 
you know, they they get Kirill to not go through with it. And yeah, just really, really let's see, I feel like is there any Right, the, yeah, and then the yeah, when Anna gains custody of Tatiana's baby, she names the baby Christine. That's also I'm not entirely sure that like would she be able to be granted like legally be granted custody I don't know I mean I guess maybe Nikolai can have the other cop pull some strings since they're he's working for the government too but it just yeah it, it feels yeah but but it is very sweet there at the end with her taking care of, of baby Christine and that brings us to the final section notes taken before watching and let's see right so yeah um, yes yeah, so according to IMDb trivia none of the characters who were members of okay I'm gonna try Vori Zakone used a gun throughout the movie the reason for this is that when doing research on Russian organized crime Cronenberg discovered that members typically prefer to use knives instead of guns the rationale for this is that if members were arrested by police and questioned as to why they were in possession of such weapons, the suspects could evade suspicion by claiming the knives were simply for linoleum cutting. Which does make a lot of sense. You know, I hate to give credit to organized crime, but yeah, you know, it's if you're caught in London with a gun, yeah, you're that's not, you know, if it was America, that they might not be in trouble, but yeah. In, in London, you're not going to just, yeah. Uh, yeah, and in one of the behind-the-scenes things, Cronenberg expressed that he liked that it wasn't a traditional love story. The leads don't end up together. Let's see, and... Okay, so one of the... One one critic or user reviewer said, The surprise twist, which won't be unexpected to some viewers, which... As I mentioned, I don't think is you know a problem or unintentional. Introduces more problems than it solves and leads in part to the incomplete feeling that accompanies the ending. So I don't I don't really agree with that, but he's entitled to his opinion. I, I wish that I understood what he meant, but you know. He's entitled to, they're entitled to their opinion. Cronenberg resorted to cheap tricks at the end when he puts a baby in danger to create a race against time finale. It felt desperate, like the product of a screenwriter who didn't know how else to end the movie. That is true. Like, there is a logical reason for the baby being in danger there, but it's, yeah, I had forgotten from my first viewing. It really does feel like just, yeah, uh, you know. It, it doesn't feel as, as like, there's a lot in the movie that feels organic to the movie. And, uh, yeah, Cronenberg brings a highly homoerotic charge to the film. Much of the film's action is driven by the fact that Stahl is embarrassed by his gay son, who isn't man enough for the role he needs to fill. In the film's most memorable scene, a completely nude Mortensen fights savagely to the death in a Turkish bath. I commend Cronenberg for this scene. In our movie culture, it's been completely acceptable for ages to juxtapose naked female flesh to violence, but when the same is done with a male body, people sit up and take notice. Viggo Mortensen joked to Conan, the late-night host, not the barbarian, that it wasn't in the script. David just told him to do it. Women in movies are frequently just there for men to look at, not empathize with, and yeah, here the the... Yeah, it's 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 fascinating, but there is just there is a fear of naked male bodies in Western culture. You know, naked female bodies are gawked at, but naked male bodies. There's a lot of men who don't want to see another man naked because they're worried they'll feel inadequate or attracted to him. 
which, you know, if you're very homophobic, that is, yeah. Let's see, and um, we have the... Right. Uh, one user reviewer wrote, "Maybe it was my inab that, that you know they didn't like the movie. Maybe it was my inability to relate to a woman concerned with a child, or to a mobster with a conscience." So, I get the idea of like, oh, you know, mobster with a conscience. That seems like you know, completely paradoxical. You know, uh, what's what's that saying? Um, a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron. But you can't relate to a woman concerned with a ch I don't I'm not gonna touch that one. I think I, I spent too much time in my recent videos talking about because there's a lot to unpack there and I don't I don't Yeah. Um seek help. When Mortensen is being judged back to Craig Reeves, when Mortensen is being judged based on his tattoos, one of them uh, let's see. Yeah, one of the men judging him says his father worked for law enforcement. By the end of the movie, we know that he is undercover, so basically he shares his father's goals, but not necessarily. We don't know for sure if his dad was undercover and caught, or plainclothes, his methods. He thinks that the way to destroy the mafia is to bring it down from the inside, not using the law. And it is, of course, this thing of when you see generations of... Uh, because, you know, the, the Russian mob did not you know, poof into existence yesterday. It's been around for a very long time. And, yeah, there are a number of cops who've tried to, to take them down through legal means. Let's see. And, and you know, they're still around. The, you know, those cops are not around, but the mafia is. The acting here is superb. I think the movie could have done without the Naomi, Anna, and Vico, Vigo Nikolai love storyline, which I thought was banal and added nothing, but it looks like I'm alone in this. In any case, for me, the love story here is between Nikolai and the capo's son, Kirill. The latter is loud, histrionic even, and eager to prove that he's not what his father thinks he is, but his repressed homosexuality is blatant and his silent disapproval of the father's way is quite apparent at times, and of course Nikolai is fully aware of both things. Kirill is a tormented individual and very lonely, looking for genuine affection in his father and finding none. He's also a man hopelessly in love with someone, Nikolai, who would probably only fully reciprocate to serve his own interests and who benefits from his sexual and emotional isolation. Cassell's performance is simply perfect. I would even rate him slightly above Viggo Mortensen, who excels all the time. In my opinion, he's a vastly underrated actor. Kirill's underlying tenderness and excruciating longing come to the service, surface for some very brief moments when Nikolai has a caring, intimate gesture or word, and then, ashamed or panicked, he retreats to a wannabe machista thug attitude again. It's fascinating to watch. Um, Kirill was the one I was referring to in the review about, you know, every so often he loses control. He just, yeah. And Vigo's personality is never really exposed, never beyond much more than downplayed intelligence, natural charm. He always seems like both an outsider and an adamant insider. His moral compass swinging around throughout the film, never landing squarely on a single spot. Even when the film itself is mediocre and plotting, he is always fascinating to watch, never knowing when his character may evolve into something we haven't yet been shown. See, I, I would argue just his character alone makes the movie worth watching. It's just, it's so, it's so fascinating, you know, and this, yeah, Cronenberg, it's not always the character, but Cronen, Cronenberg always has something fascinating in his movies, I've, in all of the ones I've watched. There's always something where you just, you, yeah, you can't look away. And, yeah, so one person really took issue with the movie saying what's wrong with the writers of this movie in what universe 
an unidentified woman dies in a modern hospital and the police doesn't get involved, especially when her baby survives. They would surely demand any personal items, such as her purse and diary, and even if they didn't, what nurse slash midwife would hold on to it instead of giving it to the police and start instead playing detective, going around poking at the Russian mob nonetheless. And since we're talking about impossible, how unlikely is that the dying underage mother went into that pharmacy right when she was about to give birth, then lost consciousness and never recovered, with never a chance to give her name or any information. This is beyond absurd. The rest of the movie is not horrible. I am half an hour in, but the plot hole is simply grinding my gears so much that I had to vent. And yeah, like I mentioned in the review, some people are not going to be at all okay with... There's definitely some some problems there, and and yeah, honestly, the answers to most of the questions that I just quoted them as a asking is because that that's how they wanted the movie to work out. You know, there's not real, there's not a good answer. Uh, yeah. I suppose whether or not that's a good answer is is you know subjective. There's not an answer that's like realistic. You know. And, let's see, yeah, um, the movie especially lost its credibility at three points. The mother dying without any authorities interfering, Kirill's abduction of the baby, especially when it's shown that he would have had to pass hospital staff, and obviously Nikolai's sudden revelation of undercover police agent status. I don't know if maybe the reason the authorities don't get involved is that the the you know the mafia influence maybe but then if that's the case then how can they arrest him on dna evidence yeah it's i it doesn't completely hold up to to close scrutiny while in recent years he's moved on to more psychological fare, Cronenberg's latter-day work still demonstrate a keen fascination with corporeal themes. 2005's History of Violence, for example, shows in unfettered detail the brutal consequences a bullet at close range has on an assailant's face. The squirm-inducing imagery, however, is a mere surface-level shock. The film's real message is in its subtext that violence is a soul-sucking, family-destroying maelstrom that is not easily escaped. Eastern Promises, Cronenberg's thematic follow-up, plays with a similar duality. The skin of the film is inked with distressing physical brutality, while its meat and bones, its emotional core, is a cold examination of whether violence and lies are ever really justified. And it's, it's very true. Uh, you know, think about all the things that Nikolai lets happen, even some things he does, for, for the big picture, you know. So, yeah. And, uh, let's see, yeah, and, and one user said, if you're looking for recurring themes that run through Cronenberg's work, there are few regularly revisited, then the idea of body modifications and how modern technology causes people to undergo physical changes that reflect either their true identities or the way they want the world to perceive them. Let's see, and... Yeah, one of the IMDb quotes is, okay, now I'm going to do his teeth and cut off his fingers. You might want to leave room. It's always teeth with you. I believe that the reason that Cronenberg shows us this happening is a fascination with the idea that someone's identity can be completely removed by killing them and altering their body like this. Uh, you know, yeah, as I just quoted another critic saying, you know, yeah, body alteration and... Yeah, you know, it's because there is this sense like when when someone dies, uh, you know, a lot of people take some comfort in the fact that they can live on in the memories of others, but what if you alter their body so it cannot be identified? You know, does that remove the the identity, you know, just yeah. And Let's see. Yeah, so back to a back to critics. Rarely has a filmmaker been less interested in his ostensible protagonist than Cronenberg is with Anna. An audience surrogate, she disappears for long passages only to resurface to do inane things like confront possible maniacs 
on the sidewalk screaming, she was 14, she was just a child. Screenwriter Stephen Knight, whose Dirty Pretty Things was similar, was a similarly plotted tale of an innocent trying to navigate through the nefarious dark corners of present-day London immigrants, gives Anna little backstory or personal idiosyncrasies besides the annoying, colorful, stiltedly acted Russian relatives she lives with, leaving her with nothing to do but embody dull righteousness. And, you know, I, I think I might have mentioned earlier in this video, I certainly talked about in other videos about Cronenberg. He doesn't seem that interested in his protagonists, in, in various of his films. He's interested in the ideas that can be explored through those characters. But, yeah, it's true, he's, he's, he's really not very interested in, in Anna. Let's see, and... Way before Semyon learns that Kirill is being ridiculed by his enemies for possibly being gay, Cronenberg has already amped up the homoerotic tension. In Kirill insisting on watching Nikolai have sex with a prostitute from behind, as well as in Nikolai's bowls out escape from the grip of two goons inside a Turkish bath. Cronenberg's contemplation of codes of masculine honor by anxiously putting the male body on the line is deliciously transgressive. Cronenberg may concern himself with the physical details in his movies, but little is made of the social conditions and relations from which they arise. That is true. And that's, again, you know, when you look at, like, several of the movies that he... Yeah, the, the movies where he really hits it out the park, and that he's especially known for, Scanners, Videodrome, and The Fly, are not so much about real-life social conditions. All three of them are driven by this science fiction element. That's where the, the physical, you know, yeah, the physical changes that are a major part of those three movies that's where that comes from and thus he's you know he's he's very very good at zeroing in on you know the here's here's the thing that happened and here's all the stuff that that led to you know scanners does such a phenomenal job interrogating what does it do to different people how do how do different people respond to try to try to cope with the the you know es essentially it is of a stand-in for schizophrenia you know the the uh, the scanning ability you know and and because it is you know completely specific to that to to this sci-fi very variation on schizophrenia yeah the the movie's about that but yeah here it's you know it doesn't seem that interested in why is there a Russian mafia? What, what, you know, what gets people to join a, a mafia? Why, why do they choose a life of crime where they might get their throat slit for something they didn't even know they, you know, they, they, they were just being told to, to do this, and they did it, and now they're getting killed, you know. Why wouldn't they get, a, you know, a, a job job, like something where they're, they're safe? And, you know, of, of course, the, the reality, the, the answer to that, with, with Russia and, and with various other places, you know, it's, it can be very difficult to make an honest living. You may be at the mercy of, like, the the yeah the organized criminals. So you might almost paradoxically be safer, at least feel safer, if you are, if not a member of the organized crime syndicate, maybe at least working with them. You know, tolerating, you know, ma making it clear that you're not going to snitch on them and. Yeah, that's that's true of of Russia. It's it's true of various countries around the world, or at least was in the in the glory days of the the crime family. And yeah, it's really badass when Nikolai puts out a cigarette on his tongue, seemingly feeling no pain. But I would love to see an outtake 
where you know he's he so he takes the cigarette and oh upper my tongue upper my tongue and let's see yes that is it for this video so hit me up in the comments let me know what is your favorite gritty gangster story honestly just let me know what's your favorite gangster movie in general you know I've given a couple of examples tell you what I'll I'll briefly in case so it's been a little because I set them at very early in this video so yeah you know uh, Godfather trilogy various Scorsese movies Scarface 1983 American Gangster this you know and let's see yes if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page once you more links to stuff like relevant playlists they suggest a video for you to watch on the screen right about now I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie I do a weekly video currently yes a, a weekly vlog about a uh, horror thing which these days is usually an episode of blood curse I also do a weekly video of a current Disney Plus or Hulu thing it's when that is when there is something for me to do currently it's a murder at the end of the world I try to do a daily but it doesn't always work out to be daily episode of a Marvel TV show I am actually finishing season three of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. today which means tomorrow I start on season two of Agent Carter and recently reviewing thoughts videos tend to come up very similar to this one in other words if you want videos like this you're not you can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording I will catch you next time. I'm just a driver.